So welcome to another episode of uh, Three Pillars of D&D Cast. I'm Jesse. And I'm Tyler. And today we're going to be talking about Strixhaven in general as a campaign setting and just how we think um, one of the many ways we can go about using Strixhaven as uh, a campaign setting to do different kinds of, of things. So that's what this one's all about. Yep. Strixhaven is very obviously, you know, it's a magic school, and of course it invokes things of the popular franchise Harry Potter. Yeah, of course. Even, like, the logo of it is very Harry Potter. Yeah, I... With I, the shield and the thing on top, and the th- name on the bottom kind of curled sides, and the frills, and the segment shields, I mean... Yeah. yeah, the thing on top is tricks, by the way, which is just a type of owl. Yeah, they're really not trying that hard to get away from Harry Potter because, um, like, one of the things that uh, Mark Rosewater, the you know, one of the main designers at, of Magic the Gathering, one of the things he talks about is resonance, and this has resonance with the audience, right? Like. The people who are going to want to, uh, are, are going to like Strixhaven are the same ones who are going to like Harry Potter and Hogwarts. It's just the truth of it. Yeah. So this is meant to be for people who want that Harry Potter kind of game in D&D, but, you know. Not Harry Potter. But not Harry Potter. Whether whether in they just. In a non-turf way. Yeah. Mostly, yeah. If they want to avoid the whole turfiness of, of rallying, or maybe they just don't want to be in Harry Potter because that like creates an expectation if when you're trying to run a game to be yeah. like that. Whereas the advantage of a new world like this is you can kind of make your own rules and change things up and so people don't aren't necessarily couched with with, with how it's supposed to be. Yeah, so this gives you a lot of freedom to do what you want. Exactly. You know, even like the exact spec, like you know, specifics of the schools and the whole system is left kind of vague. You know, you can do a lot with this. You know, exactly. You know, since it's D and D, you can you can really add a lot of your own elements, throw your own homebrew in, really, really do your own thing. I mean, remember, campaign settings aren't set in stone. You can do what you want. So th- that's a nice thing. But I think when they when they made Strixhaven, I think there was a part of the when they were making the camp when they were making the the set for Magic the Gathering, they went this would probably work for Dungeons and Dragons too. Maybe we should do this. Kind of amazing that the set came out in April and the book's coming out in what November. They obviously knew before the set came out that they wanted to do this as a D&D campaign setting. It wasn't like the success of the set spurred them to make a D&D campaign. It was like, yeah, we're going to do this, you know? Yeah, like the previous two books was Ravnica, um, which is one of the most visited planes in Magic the Gathering, is fairly beloved, um, and Theros, another fairly beloved plane which would be very easy to put in D&D because of its um Greek ins- inspiration. Yeah, I mean and, yeah, it feels like Greek inspired things are just easy to put in D&D. It's just how it is. You know. I think you put everything. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. Tons of fiction is spurred by Greek mythology. Yeah, Greek mythology is wonderful because they're all cause the Greek gods are so humanist. Like so human, Our yeah. Modern interpretations of Greek mythology is so wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you really look at the mythology, some of it's pretty. Ooh. But yeah, the if you revision it, it's it's it, it's nice. So like. Like here for and for the, our podcast audience, they have we have the letter of acceptance, and it is literally a, a, a letter shaped like an owl. You know, like it folds out and it has your little letter of acceptance in there. Once again, you're gonna get that Harry Potter feel of you're getting your owl right. Like that's the thing that people say, like that they're mad that they didn't get their owl or whatever. You know, like. It's gonna be like the sub, the the sub like name of this episode. Yeah. You're gonna get this Harry Potter feel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Strixhaven. It's not Harry Potter. Well, um, it kind of is. <laughs> it kind of is. 
So, I, I mean, I like that they we have all this concept art basically in the set that we can use to kind of, kind of see where they're going to probably go with this campaign setting. And... And I'm all for it. I like the idea of a magical school. I like, you know, the idea of putting yourself in a in a in a house or a college or you know whatever you want to call it. But that you know they call it colleges here. But like sorting yourself is great. And for those of the audience who uh, you know are are, are mag- play Magic the Gathering, the fact that these are an enemy color set means that there's always this internal conflict within each of the schools that plays really well for stories it make it makes great stories because there's going to be rivalries within each of the schools themselves each of the colleges plus each of the yeah. colleges are going to have rivalries with each other but the, at the same time they're all part of the same college so they all should all get along just like each of the members of each individual college should get along yeah. when the time is needed right yeah every like every college is like two sides of the same coin it's going to make for good stories, and I, I think it's fun. And then you have the overlaps of each of the colleges as well, you know, because of uh, of the shared colors of philosophies, and philosophies are going to be the big part about the colors. So just think of them as philosophies. Silver Quill, for example, is going to have overlap with Lorehold and Witherbloom because parts of their philosophies are going to overlap, but they're also not going to necessarily get along. Witherbloom takes different parts of the Black philosophy than what Silver Quill does. It, exactly. Know? But there might be people in Silver Quill who get along with certain people in Witherbloom really well, but not other people in Witherbloom, you know? So... That's I don't know. Doesn't everyone love a good hippie? Well, yeah, but <laughs> some people love them when you know they're giving them some funky brew um, and a fun potion to play with, and some of them like them when those hippies are on fire. So everyone loves hippies a different way. <laughs> <laughs> Another aspect about this is. We have a, bu- a bunch of different ways you can kind of start a campaign, right? One of the aspects of, of Strixhaven is that for the first year, students don't choose their specialty. They kind of use it as a probationary period to learn the basics of magic and to figure out where they want to like specialize in. They can get, I think they can get recommendations from professors and yeah. there's a sort of a sorting process to a certain degree. I think they had to be accepted and it, it's, it's a good place to start. You could even have like, Maybe even just be like a zero level for the uh, characters or maybe just a first level that lasts for a little bit. Maybe you don't have to rush the levels. This is like the big split and like how you're going to start a campaign. Yeah, you could have your players be first years and that, you know, you probably set them like level one or zero because, you know, level one would imply that like warlocks and sorcerers have chosen a subclass. Uh, specifically, yeah, but yeah, you start them at what, yeah, one or zero, oh, and then have them pick their school. Or you can start them at level three with their school already picked. That's the big difference between starts of Strict Saban. And I, and I think you could even do um, a little bit of having. Have them pick where they want to go, like assuming they're level three at some point. But maybe you could run a short zero level or first level campaign, but don't give them any of the abilities if they're a warlock or sorcerer, for example. Do like a real quick, like one or two session flashback episode, like kind of like they're meeting like a flashback meeting and maybe they could run some elements and, you know, like feel out how their characters would have interacted with each other at the beginning, but they ultimately know where they're going with their characters. And so you just do that for like one or two sessions and then you jump up to level three and start into a something new. And then you can have little flashback moments here and there as a DM to kind of fill in little story blanks you need or, you know, introduce characters that you, that they should have known, but you didn't, you just kind of glossed over yeah. or whatever, you know, you can do some things like that. There's a lot you can do with, with that early level stuff. I mean, there's a lot of really great, you know, I think there's lots of really great locations that they have built into the, uh, into this set. They have, you know, like, especially at the school itself, we have like the archway commons and it's like this really beautiful picture of garden hedge mazes and these cool archways that they have all over. It's all over Arcavios. The whole idea is it's supposed to really have that cool college feel from the college movies feel to it overall when, when you're looking at this this setting oh and, my God. that'd be a that'd be a fun campaign writing Strixhaven, haven like typical like on you know college comedy movie yeah 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like, like casual students getting like drunk. <laughs> yeah, getting drunk and having hazing rituals and and you know, Dean, you know, um, <laughs> you you could do some, you could do, you could definitely do some comedy in, in a college setting for sure. That's something too. Is it's supposed to be young people? They set it dumb up to people. Yeah. But they said, <laughs> of course, young people are all dumb. There's like, so there's a certain, you can do a lot of that as well. That whole coming of age, discovering themselves kind of storylines as well. Overall, I just don't feel Strixhaven is the best loca- is the best campaign setting for people who want a ton of combat. Like there is, they do teach combat magic, of course. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's one of the big things. And mage duels happen on a regular basis. Like, that's supposed to be like one of the elements. So you will be dueling with other students here and there, like from other colleges or even within your own college, but mostly with other colleges, right? Yeah, you do a lot of duels, count to ten. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and But the whole idea is they're not deadly. They're not supposed to be deadly, you know? Like, that's against the rules. Yeah. But as long as you, you're just knocking them out, you know, or at least go over there and cast a freaking heal spell on them so they don't die you're probably fine right so i i I like i like that aspect i i I like that they one of the things that they they've also built in is they have a lot of these various constructs and and other yeah mechanical creatures basically that are walk around that can help the students and help them get from place to place and um they help in the biblioplex too when we we talk about the biblioplex we'll, we'll talk about that there's a lot of them that work there there's a lot of things to sort. It, it makes for fun little moments. You can have goofy little constructs that do silly little things. They can add a little bit of like comedy or maybe some tension too. If you if if you can maybe have them lead them down the wrong path that they shouldn't have gone or something like that too. Some of the like some of the like some of the cards illustrate like introduction to uh, environmental science, for example, and it's just wonderful picture. You you kind of see it has. Um, all the different five colors of magic on there. There's going to be a lot of these introductory classes, and there's going to be overlaps. You know, we're not going to have students who just do, you know, st- strictly stick to, to one or two things. They might learn to do all kinds of different kinds of spells. The whole idea is to really mature them as mages overall. Some of this artwork for these introductory lesson things are really fun. Like, they have this one girl who, like, Blew, is like blowing up her table or something. I'm not sure what she's doing, but it's uh, it's introduction yeah. to annihilation is the name of the class, <laughs> <laughs> and that's just wonderful, right? <laughs> like, in, in a world where magic exists, you're gonna end up having these different kinds of classes, right? That are gonna be more than just you know math and science and Dude. writing. Yeah, those are important too, but. Here we can also have just straight classes that talk about how to blow things up properly and how to control that power and, and things like that. You could have some really good moment interesting moments with your with your characters. Remember that like like this particular picture we're looking at now is a scene of a celebration at the end of the semester is what this card is, is about. But like this campaign setting really lends itself to moments of joy and levity you remember you're you're young people in a college setting you're going to work together there might be rivalries but you're also still friends yeah and even isn't yeah it's not like gonna be a yay gritty your favorite npc dies or that one player makes a heroic sacrifice no it's just a time of learning fun I mean, and joy it's not like sabotaging your rival with like a spell that you know reduces their intelligence thing you know it's yeah it's just about having fun and you know casting spells in a college setting exactly i mean yeah you could have somebody die but like it should happen like once <laughs> You know, like even then, I would encourage it. Yeah, I, I would, I would save it for you. You had to really earn that moment, right? It needs to be somebody that's been with you know in it for a while. Is you're not going to be killing people willy nilly, right? Also, it, I think it should be like in maybe like a death that happened because of a role and not like a story death. I think that also be good. You know, like an accident. Yeah. You know. 
yeah, I, you could do that too. I mean, there's a lot of different things. And, you know, just to, to tie in other products, I think you could probably pull in some of those mysteries from Candle Keep and you might be able to, we might be able to reflavor some of them to fit in with Shixhaven as well as part of an overarching campaign. Cause I really do think mysteries and intrigue and, and politics yeah. could have a, a good place in Shixhaven as well. Yeah. Also, like, um, Candle Keep Mystery is all about books. Well, didn't you say Strixhaven has like the biggest library in the multiverse? Yeah, it, it does. Like, it yeah, certainly of does. There'd be some magical or important books in Strixhaven that would cause a mystery. That makes sense. <laughs> exactly. So, such as, as we're looking at this wonderful picture here of a book being gripped by a tiny gargoyle construct. Um, I think this one is actually sorting the books. But you can see in the background that there's all these different levels of this library. It's huge, right? It's just giant, giant library. And it's probably going to rival Candlekeep in size. You know, just just a library at, at Strixhaven. Not rival. To. I'm sure it's a lot bigger Yeah, it, it, and it, it should be. It's supposed to contain every spell in the multiverse. The whole idea is to keep all of them to kind of have like this, uh, you know, Library of Alexandria feel to it, right? That can lend itself to some really dangerous or or mysterious things happening. The books in the Biblioplex, you don't really find them, they find you. That's something as a DM you can really run with. You can have these books just kind of show up when the characters are doing research. Or one of the servants, you know, mechanical constructs, just like drop something by for them because they thought they might need it or whatever. You know, there, there's a lot of different things you can do with that. And it's just kind of built into the world. Sometimes I know I struggle to come up with a reason why players should do things. <laughs> and having like a kind of a built-in system is nice. You know, it's supposed to happen. Yeah, saying like this, there's always incentive to do things. You have classes. Exactly. You know? There's always research topics that you have to... You have to do this by, you know, Monday. So you have to figure out how to do it, right? And yeah. so that might mean pouring through scrolls or books in, in the library. You know, that might mean doing some field research. You know, that might mean leaving school grounds to go do something, right? It's a world that's relatively at peace. There are conflicts and problems, of course. There's a whole group called the Auric that's a, a whole other can of worms. Of, of rivalry and issues to deal with you know there's a lot to explore and a lot of incentive to do that exploring you know for for your classes i mean that alone is enough motivation to get players out to do stuff do you think milestone or experience is what you would do for a, a campaign like this oh i mean that's well, a... i think what i think i would do that would do experience and more difficult classes, so like advanced classes, would give more experience. So to show that you're learning more, yeah, I would do. Yeah, you could do that in a way. Uh, people could uh, decide what classes they want to take to try to build their character up the fastest, or to push them to do things they wouldn't normally do. You know? Yeah, or like, yeah, maybe certain classes could like. Give you a feat when you finish it yeah. instead of the normal feat system. Yeah, a campaign strict haven should really show the fact that you're taking these classes and that you're learning. You know, you're learning stuff and skills and abilities from these classes. No, I agree. If you if you're doing a very focus on the classes campaign, I think you're right. I think uh, the experience system would work good. If you're trying to um, kind of run an arc every year like you have a very like you have a some kind of conflict that's supposed to take the entire year you know structured more like a harry potter book kind of style yeah i think milestone would be better i yeah. I, I think there, you're gonna, there's gonna be a lot of you do this thing that happens and it like there's a really intense like two week or uh, you know five days or two weeks or whatever and then like you skip three months you know see i actually don't like that because how you know how school and education in the works you know it goes day by day you know you can't it's not like school you can like pay attention for five days and that sums up the school year i think uh you know a campaign where the whole point is that you're in a school it should be about the classes that's just me well yeah no i, I get what you're saying i i'm I, what i think i'm trying to say is that there's going to be certain campaigns where the classes are going to take the back seat 
speak to the stuff that's happening outside of class. Yeah. And there's going to be certain campaigns that are going to be about the class, right? So I, I think it depends on what kind of campaign you're running. It's going to make a big difference. Also, it could be difficult um, how to balance, like, you know, because if you have a large amount of people, you're probably going to have a large spread of difference. You know, colleges, you know. And, and I think if you had a lot of, of players, the minutia of the day to day classes might be a too much. You it know? might. And they're not always going to be in the same classes together if they're all from different colleges, right? Yeah, it could be difficult. The way, like, our campaigns tend to be, you know, one DM and two players, I think that the minutia of day-to-day, because they're probably going to be either in the same college or, you know, they're gonna you're going to mostly focus on the classes that they have together. And I, yeah. I think that that would work very well for, for that Especially kind of us. Like, I'd probably take Quandrix. He'd probably take, like, Prismari. Yeah, I, I mean, like, say Emma runs it. I'm going to take Witherbloom. You're going to pr- take Quandrix, right? We're going to have a little bit of overlap, you know, uh, uh, on the green side. But at the same time, like like you said, if I was writing it, it would you'd be maybe running Quandrix. Maybe you'd try Lorehold, and she'd be in Prismari. Then you'd overlap in the red stuff, right? I mean, there, there's, there's that element to it as well. So you kind of see how it all works out. But also... The stuff that happens outside of class is going to be important as well. There's outside classes, but there's also probably going to be, like, you know, more universal classes, you know? It's not like every class is, like, for one color or for one college. Is You know, there's probably going to be, like, basic arcane, basic information gathering, basic, etc. Exactly. Just to kind of get an idea of the scale of, of the Biblioplex, it is just monstrous. It's probably, like, ten stories just in the base level, and then it has, like, a dome section that's probably another ten or fifteen stories stories on its own at least that thing's huge yeah and then on top of that in the basement area they have what they call the the hall of of champions i think it is uh or the hall of heroes something like that and i mean it's just full of giant statues of legendary mages and stuff and that's like a giant amphitheater section it's just huge i mean it just has huge things inside of a huge building it's just amazing yeah like it's the size of it's hard to think of it comparison yeah it's it's hard to get a scale yeah i mean i, I look at it and it kind of yeah it's hard to you give can a scale see, like these houses just like next to it and there's this like giant towery bibliophax exactly you know? it's just it's amazing it's huge and it's wide open too like you'll notice that it has a bunch it's like really open air that just lends itself to lots of different approaches on things. And yeah, it, it, it just has this enormous scale. It's like a city sized building. It's amazing. <laughs> I'd probably say, like, just one of those little, like, towers on the side that's pulling it up, you know, the ones with, that's capped with blue, you know, those. I'd yeah. probably say it's the size of, like, some of those, like, really tall buildings in, like, New York. Yeah, you know, so now it's like some of the tallest buildings in the world. And it's like <laughs> less than half of the total height. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 ridiculously big, and it, it's it just makes me happy because I like books. Before we move on to the next section, let's go ahead and take a short break. <laughs> Welcome to the sellout break where we try to sell you our stuff, but we have nothing to sell, so it doesn't really work. But we should get merch. We should get merch. I don't know how or why and who would buy it, but we should get some. We sell for like ridiculously high, just like yeah, you know, three hundred dollars for a here. bottle of water. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, either way, if you want to get a hold of us. Um, we're on Twitter at our dorky. Um, if you want to email us with question thoughts, um, things you'd like to see on the show, any of that kind of stuff, it's our dorky family at gmail.com. If you're listening to this on a podcast, we have it in a YouTube. If you're on the YouTube. We have this in a podcast. Podcasts are all the major ones. You can, you can pretty much find us on all of those. So there you go. So other than the merchandise, what else can we sell these people? Go buy Shrick Haven when it comes out. Yeah, we don't get any money for that. Yeah, we don't get any money for that, but you should do it anyways. All the Magic Gathering books have been good, and I feel like for this one, 
I think everyone should buy. I mean, I think everyone should buy the other ones, but like it's a magical school. You know, I feel like the Magic Gathering label will just like hold it down. Yeah, badly. and and don't let it. They do serious world building on these. And, I, and at this point, I think we're drifting into the episode again. So welcome back from the break. They do serious world building when they make when they make these worlds and sets. They have a whole team that's dedicated to it. So it's not just like they're just going to slap a world together based on a bunch of cards that some Yahoo made. They have world building guides. If you find the if you find the art books that they sell for the different planes, like you can see all the stuff that they they come up with that never even makes it into the set so that they understand the world fully. Just like you would do if you were building a campaign, you know, your own homebrew campaign world. You'd want to know more about all the little details. You may never tell your players the, the little stuff about how the bread is made in a certain village, but you know, and that's important, and that helps you yeah. decide how, you know, Gertrude talks about her breads. Is there something... Like great, like you know, details and like, like, like all the colleges have their own ways of casting spells. You know, like lore hole, they use scrolls. You know, silver quill, it's all about words. Wither bloom is all about components. Um, I think Prismari is all about the um physical movements of your body. Is that it? Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's probably more like the somatic components and more than anything. Andrix is math. Math, the formulas. Just the whole the formula. Yeah, yeah, the whole the whole like ritual formula ritual. I mean, they are kind of the same thing if you think about it, of how of the spells are put together. They're all about yeah. mastering the details of that and how you can manipulate the little bits and pieces of of, of those to affect the spell. That's why it makes sense that a sorcerers are one of the of the classes that can be yeah. in Quandrix, for example. The two classes for Quandrix fit so perfectly. You know, you know, sorcerers about you know getting into the minutia, the bit of math, math, and you know, knowing and you know, knowing how to empower a spell. And but while wizard is about just knowing a lot of spells using that intelligence, of yours. Exactly, and that reminds me, Strixhaven helps bridge that gap um, that D and D kind of never had with um, with Harry Potter. In that, by doing these cross class system they came up with, at first I thought it was. I mean, I'll be honest. At first I thought it was kind of a lazy way of doing things, but now I'm starting to get it. Sorcerers and warlocks are learning spells kind of like wizards do right and that's kind of how in harry potter and other ma and other magic based worlds too people have a natural magical talent like sorcerers but then they can also learn magic too so they can get better at it but they're always going to rely on their natural abilities a little more and yeah. then you have your wizards who are going to be more like your like Hermione and stuff like that, who she didn't have any natural talent, but she studied her ass off, and now she's an amazing wizard, right? You know, to make a good reference, it's kind of like, you know, kind of like Naruto. You know, they kind of teach similar things to everybody, but everyone also has their own, you know, natural abilities. You combine that with, with their race as well, you have kind of what, how it all comes together, right? Even though there's only five subclasses they're going to focus on in these books, you can really iterate it in many different ways, and there can, they can have their own unique qualities to them. And I think that's, like, sometimes restriction breeds creativity, and I, and I think you can get a lot of creativity out of this out of the uh, the restrictions they kind of give you in a way, right? So another way that um, Six Haven will remind you of Harry Potter is Mage Tower. Mage Tower is the they're they're kind of like um, Quidditch, not as complicated, but that's probably a good thing. We're playing we're playing Dungeons and Dragons. If we're going to have a sport where everyone's running around doing things, we probably don't want to run and we don't, probably don't want to have it too complicated. Yeah. Just so I, I make sure I get this right, the basic rules of Mage Tower are this: two opposing teams meet in the stadium. Each team is composed of five mages plus one small mascot creature. You know, e each of them have their own their own mascots. Prismaris have their elementals. You know, um, Quandrix, Quandrix has, has has their fractals. Silver Quill has their Inklings. Wither Bloom has their pests, which are just adorable and gross at the same time. I love them. Um, they're great. They're great. Um, and Lorehold then Lorehold has spirits. 
Yeah, it has their spirit statue things. So then, yeah, you have your, your, your mascot. Then each team has a tall tower at the end of their stadium with their mascot creature at the top. The goal is to score a point by stealing the opposing team mascot and transporting it back to your own tower. Um, so basically, it's like capture the flag. All magic that would harm a player, mascot, spectator, or that would damage the stadium or the basic rules of the game in any way is nullified. Otherwise, all magic is legal, subject to the review of the Mage Tower Referee Council. The game lasts for three phases, which are approximately 20 minutes apiece, and after the third phase, if you have the most points, you win, obviously. This encourages... If you're going to have a uh, mage tower as part of your campaign, you could have players who actually spend their their spell slots or, you know, the spells known and stuff like that just so they can give advantage in mage tower if certain of the players are on, on the mage tower team. So they're not just going to be making, they're not just going to be just choosing spells for combat purposes. There's going to be that extra role-playing purpose outside of, of, of combat to, to take certain spells as well. On top of the, all the other the stuff that should be non-combat that they're taking spells for i think as well so obviously mage tower is not gonna be for everybody you know it, it's just a way for if you feel like you need to have that sports moment in your in your college you can do that you can just have it as a backdrop of something that the players just go and watch right root for their favorite teams and oh i do think it would be fun to play you know there's several great spells and like i all i'm already thinking of strategies and i don't really even care about you know sports in real life i'm thinking like all types of strategies for this <laughs> <laughs> exactly and and you can have a really fun show don't tell moment with your players here as well like especially if you have them come in as first year students right and you can have like this cool thing where you have this whole scripted game that goes on and you tell them all the cool stuff that all the players are doing it with each other to make them kind of want to play mage tower right you, you can you can have a really cool scene that you describe that is kind of built into your your campaign and you can have other things happen during the event i mean Obviously, this is the main form of, of entertainment other than watching random mage duels happen that's going to be here. You know, I mean, there's plenty of other things to do, too, I'm sure. Like, like one of the stories talks about a major eatery um, where a, a troll is like has the best cafe on the college campus. There's there's lots of fun little things that they've kind of built into this world that when this campaign setting goes, comes out, they've already filled it with really wonderful ideas already. Yeah. On, oh, my God. That's by self. Which is a fun idea. Also, what I would do is I would have like cafes just like everywhere. Oh yeah, fun. just yeah, just like every single corner. It's like the Starbucks equivalent. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. Um. <laughs> So speak, speaking of trolls, there's just all kinds of different people in this, like, different kinds of people in this world. Uh, one of the major races is called the Archaics. They're like this race of giant, multi-armed, uh, this one has like eight arms. It's kind of hard to, gra to grok all of them. Um, in this picture, it's kind of the point. Kind of like your hundred-handed ones in Greek mythology, but they're like these giant stone creatures that have this vast knowledge that you can learn from, but they... They speak in like like weird riddles and, and, and stuff like that, so you can get good knowledge from them, but you have to kind of decipher what they're talking about. Obviously, this is not going to be a player character race. This is definitely going to be an NPC-style race that you come across. It, it's it's one of the many people of, of, the, of the world. Then, of course, the owl folk here. Um, that was in the UA for the Feywild. I'm yeah, sure they're going to introduce it. I'm sure they'll introduce it in the in the in the Feywild book, but hopefully they'll reprint it in Shixhaven. If not, we're going to go across a lot of races that they might put in it. So maybe yeah. maybe they'll maybe they just figured they put that in the Feywild and just leave some room for a dozen other races. I seriously think they could put a dozen races. I think in in Shixhaven. Yeah. No. I. Yeah. What's it? You could, yeah, you could, yeah, you could use the new Alpha UA, you could use the Air, Air Cockra, you could use, you could go to the plane shift documents and use the, um, Even, that'd also be a pretty good one. Yeah. There's just a lot of, there's a lot of great, um, official races to fill this one. And then we have, uh, they, they have the Bear Folk, there's not really a good <laughs> equivalent, but maybe the Shifters... Maybe Furbolg. Maybe Furbolg. I'd maybe use a custom lineage and um, yeah, do some do something fun with it. But I mean, a, a big friendly, cute bear. Um, I, I love this picture. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I think people would like mm-hmm. to have bear folk in there and, and not just, you know, never mind. I won't make that joke. Um, <laughs> Oh, I know what you're gonna make. <laughs> uh, you're the. I am the worst. You should have just said that. <laughs> now it won't fit anymore. Uh, no, we're gonna leave all that in. <laughs> then you have the Burrog, which is just a funny way of saying frog folk. And yeah. I, I like this particular picture because it looks really cool. I I never imagined a a frog in a cloak like this. I mean, it also kind of evokes um, Glenn slash Frog from Chrono Trigger too. I mean. You're obviously going to have those types. I look for what is the uh, yeah the grunge. I can never remember the name of. They have oh, the... these aren't really like the grunge because grunges are like poisonous frogs. So maybe they these could be they could do a different take on the grunge. Maybe a, a new new race, or maybe you just could homebrew yourself up something that was a uh, similar to the grunge but different. Custom lineage. Then they have these are their demons. The demons. Are multi armed, yeah, probably not going to be player characters. They seem to be multi armed monstrosities as well. I'm going to guess that there's probably some kind of tie between the archaics and the demons. Yeah, the demons are like pretty huge. Like, you can see human in the corner of that image. Like, yeah, the human is, yeah, that humanoid is quite small. So, yeah, these demons are supposed to be big. They might just be like the good and the evil, or I don't know. In Magic the Gathering, demons are like devils are in Dungeons and dragons so they might end up be called devils you know, in the campaign setting because they're actually more like devils they make deals and and stuff like that for ancient knowledge and stuff like that so well some do but some are still you know just evil I, I, they might have a little bit of both so we'll kind of see how that one plays but there's not a lot of info on them here's where the jinn this is we're probably going to use a water genasi if, if they i would like to them to do something a little new maybe Cause I, I kind of I never really cared for the Genasi that much, like mechanically. I, I love the flavor of them, and flavor wise, a water Genasi will match this just fine. You get some good water spells. Yeah, and I mean, that, actually, an air Genasi might work for this too. Technically, no, I, I, you do. I mean, it could be good. And then we have the Dryad. I'd like to see the Dryad. Them do. I really. I'm actually kind of surprised they didn't do that in the Fae Wild one. Um, they might. They might just not release that UA. That's true. I like to see Dryads. I think they'd be really interesting. I, I like the, the whole concept of them being something you could play as a race. I, I hope they make it a playable race. Because I think they'd be really interesting. Dryads are just, are just Druids, though, as a race. No, I mean, yes, in a certain degree, but, like, like, it, it, and just how um, the auntie have, like, a different way of viewing the world because of how their race is structured, I think dryads would have that, too. They just don't see the same way the other humanoids do, you know, and I, I think that could be a fun role-playing aspect to play up. Um, of course, they have dwarves as well. I, I, I think it'd be interesting to see, especially they're supposed to be dwarf wizards, obviously, spellcasters. You're, you're going to really see, hopefully, they'll, maybe they'll come up with a new subclass. Maybe they'll just expect you to use um, Tasha's rules to customize them up, make them a little different. We'll kind of see how that goes. You mean sub-race? Oh, yeah, they say subclass. I meant sub-race. Yeah. You were saying about, you are something about how um, dwarves should get a sub race that gives him intelligence right well no i i'm just saying they might have a different sub race that's arcavios flavored you know um i mean that could be an option but you know there is a a sub race for dwarfs that gives them spells right uh what the duragar or whatever yeah, the Grey Dwarf. Dark Vision, Extra Language, Advantage Saving Throws Against Illusions, Charmed or Paralyzed, Enlarged or Reduced, invisib- and Invisibility Spells. Yeah, and I think that these are supposed to be more of your, more like Mountain Dwarves and stuff. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think actually bringing a dwarf character to, um, to Shixhaven who has like these tool proficiencies and stuff like that. Then they learn some spells on top of it would make for a pretty well-rounded character anyways. So I, I'm not, I don't th- say they even need to make a sub race that's different. It has like cantrips or anything built into it that there's not necessary. I, I, I like dwarves the way they are. <laughs> the, uh, the next, next race we have are the Afridi. Once again, these are going to be like their, your fire genasi, that's probably what they'll use. They might make a new 
race for it, but I just don't see that happening. They might as well stick with what they got. Yeah, I agree. We have the Elder Dragons. Um, mostly those are going to be, you know, the five founders of the school. I Elder Dragon, that should be a race. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a player race. No, I mean... It's well, like all the other players, like humans, elves, dwarves, and this giant dragon. What's up, guys? What's up? Here to learn some spells. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, oh, which is good. No, no, I, I drunk. <laughs> but no, no, the Elder Dragons, of course, are the five founders of the, of the school. The colleges are named after one of the five dragons who managed to tackle the magic or whatever and turn it into wonderfulness or something. Obviously, not player races. Then uh, we have the elves. We have plenty of versions of elves. We certainly don't need any more. I don't know which one they're going to focus on when it comes to Arcavios. I they'll probably just go with wood elves. They do wood elves in every in every plane for some reason. Then we have they have goblins. Um, there's not a whole lot of them they talk about. This one's that I have up on the screen is a really silly one. You know, goblins can be fun. They they re, they're redoing goblins in that new UA. No, no, they haven't done goblins in that new they UA. They did kobolds. They did kobolds. They should redo goblins because I think that the current goblins I just don't think will fit in the Strixhaven that well. And I, I think they should do them a little bit better. You know, not not bruise them so bad. Of course, there's humans. Ugh, humans. You know, I, I want to be human. You're basic. All right. Um, I've never, I've never ever played a human in in Dungeons Dragons. Yeah, never. I, I haven't played it. I haven't played a human since second edition. I don't think. <laughs> um, but you play a human like ever? You're the worst. I know, right? I played a human like, fighter. Oh, <gasps> are you serious? Yeah. But I didn't dump set my charisma. I actually had the highest charisma. Um, all the other players dumps, dumped their charisma all the time. So we could never pass any persuasion checks or anything like that. So we always ended up had to kill everything because we were too stupid to talk our way out of a fight. So I made a fighter with high charisma. I Okay, that's fun. Yeah. Still a human fighter. So then there's the core. Like the core, uh, if you watch our Zendikar episode, we talked about the core and Zendikar as well. I like the core. The way they had it in the plane shift document was wonderful. They're basically halflings, but with climbing abilities, and they're medium sized instead of small. I don't think they should change them. I would just keep using the core they had from the plane shift document, just bring it right over. Maybe make some tweaks, but keep the general concept. I could show you some pictures from of some of the other parts of the world. If you're going to be exploring the world as a student, a core. It's cool. I, I, they'd work, you know. Even if they, if, if, even if they keep the concept of the core from Zendikar, where they can swing around on ropes really well and up in the high places, I don't think they do that in Strixhaven. But maybe they could. They're, they're lucky. They're l- less likely to die. So, <laughs> do you have any thoughts on the core? No, they're just really white. Or they're the only white creatures on the multiverse. Like they're actually good at, at athletic. Exactly. No, there's <laughs> actually other ones, but. Speaking of I, which, here's another one. Like, What's that? I met like, I met like white people. Oh, oh like, yeah. Only yeah. white people that are good. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Sorry. I should, I should have said people instead of creatures. <laughs> All right. So then we have the Leonin. Um, uh, they were in Theros, I believe, right? The, yeah. The stats for the Leonin there. So I'm, I'm really surprised they reprinted the, the Leonin, actually. Eh, everyone likes cat people. <laughs> I mean, a furry's got to have something to play. Um, cat, cat people, though, they're specifically lion people. Yeah, that's true. And I bet you, if you really want to ref, uh, like reflavor a t- tabaxi to fit in, you could probably bring a tabaxi in. I don't see why it wouldn't work. But basically, if you want to play a Dex Leonin, but like you know, after Tosh is everybody's Dex if you want them to be. Oh yeah, true. So Leonin are just they just have a different because they have more like the roar thing going. They have that more. They just have a different flavor to them. I would use, I would, I'd want to use a uh, Leonin, say, in uh, Silver Quill, but I'd rather use Tabaxi, say, Witherbloom or Lorehold. Lorehold, yeah, Prismari, most of the other ones. But Silver Quill, Leonin just seems like a right fit, right? Then we have the Lizard Folk. Fun fact this card is from a card called Hall Monitor. And mo- Monitor is a type of lizard. So uh, they, they were making a weird 
school joke with that one. But yeah, uh, they have lizard folk, of course, already in, in Dungeons and Dragons. You could use that. They, of course, could come up with their own Viachino variants if they want to have the Magic the Gathering version. But they'll probably just stick with lizard folk. We have the Loxodons. Those were in Ravnica, right? Yeah. Yep. I'm glad we have the Loxodons. Loxodons are fun. We have the Merfolk. They're essentially just Tritons. They also had Merfolk in various plane shift documents. Did they have them in Ravnica or did they just tell you to use Triton? No. They, yeah, they used to tell you to use Triton. Same with um Theros. Um then you have the Minotaur, which was in Theros and in Ravnica, right? I think it was in both. Yep. Yeah, it was in both books. I do love me some Minotaurs. They're fun. Mechanically they're actually not my favorite race to take, but I I need to expand my horizons and probably a little more on that so take him just because because i've never taken well, minotaur the biggest problem with minotaur is they're just bad mechanically they give you like nothing yeah minotaurs are mechanically bad because all they allow you to do is to give you horns you can attack with and they allow you to charge and when you charge you can attack with your horns now, if say you could charge and then attack with something else it might make with fun builds but no it it doesn't work like that. Yeah, and I get what they're going for flavor-wise. I remember uh, listening to a, a dungeon cast where they were talking about the Minotaur. And if what, what if, like... You gave the Minotaur never get lost, for example. An excellent sense of direction because of the whole labyrinth tie-in, right? Yeah. I mean... You can flavor minotaurs in different ways, and they just have stuck with this whole "you're a guy with horns on your head" thing. Maybe give them like a anger mechanic, like maybe when they're low on hit points, they do more damage. Yeah, damage. they could flavor, and they could do some different flavors of minotaur. I think, and I just, especially if you're going to have a a medium sized minotaur, because they're they make them all medium, right? You should make the smaller minotaur a little different than your traditional big beat 'em up minotaurs. You know? Yeah. Because, like, yes, if they were size large, honestly, I could excuse the fact that they were just beam up because you have a large size creature. How many fun builds that could be, you know? Exactly. Just giant monstrosity. You could take, like, the spell and large reduce. So you make your opponents tiny or make your opponents small or you're large and you just, like, crush them. Yeah. Like you do. Yeah. So, yeah, I hope they do something different with the Minotaur, because I just don't think the way they've done Minotaur um, lends itself to, to Shixhaven as well as it should be, and I think there's other ways you can flavor it, and I just hope they do something new. Um, then they have Ogres. Ogres are hard. I, I I don't know. They just feel like orcs, but not. Yeah, they're like, yeah, I I, I don't know. Let me look at the Ogre um, stat block real quickly, because I haven't really looked at Ogres. You know, I haven't either. Let's let's take a, a real quick second and look at that before we talk any more on it. Let's see. They get angry quickly. They're stupid. I yeah. They probably won't keep the stupid part. Like I, they just go too far. Legendarily stupid. Legendary stupidity. Few ogres can count to ten, even with their fingers in front of them. I mean, come on. So th they'll probably have to do ogres a little different if they want to have ogres as a playable race, obviously. It's supposed to be yeah. a large giant, so maybe they'll intend them to be NPCs and just kind of dumb NPCs. And I just, I don't know. This seems kind of weird. So maybe if you meet them like a dumb sweetheart, that could be fun. Like, yeah. I'd, be, I'd be okay with that, but they're both evil and stupid. They have this whole greedy collectors thing, so maybe they'll just make them really big on collecting things, like obsessive level collectors. And with even like hoarders, yeah, like hoarders or something. Maybe they'll just go a little too far with their anger and their overeating and stuff like that. Maybe drop the legendary stupidity. It doesn't really make sense in a college to have legendary stupidity. So they might have to drop that aspect of them. Yeah, um, I do hope they reinvent the ogre. I do not like how it is currently. It just feels... Yeah, they're tr they're currently trying to remove this kind of stuff from Dungeons & Dragons. That's why they got rid of, like... Why, like, orcs used to have a minus two to intelligence. They don't anymore. Yeah, so maybe they'll, maybe they'll revision the uh, ogres as if they want to make them a playable race. Maybe they just won't make them a playable race. Maybe they'll just kind of gloss over that part. You know, I don't know. So we'll see where they go with that. I hope they make them a playable race. I like... It'd be fun to play an ogre. 
Yeah, I mean, and yeah. if they could figure it out, because it had to be medium, they're not going to make it large. So if they're going to make it a medium creature, then they they need to find some way to make it unique and different from ogres. Because otherwise it just feels like ogres or trolls too much. And I, I just don't, or orcs and, and trolls too much. So speaking of which, we have, the next one is orcs. Like They have one of the, st- one of the stories you can listen to uh, or read. It focuses on, a, on, on an orc um, in Prismari. She's fairly interesting and fun, and I, I kind of like they kind of go with her. Um, I think she's supposed to be a druid. So I, I think they could do a little more with orc and make them... Uh, they could go a little further with the, the whole making orcs not as evil and dumb in, in, in Strixhaven. So maybe they'll have a revisioned orc there. Um, then we have the, the rocks... You know, there are rhino people. I yeah. really hope this gets added along with bear folk. I, I just, I'm not a furry, but they need to add more um animalistic races. Yeah, no, I, I, I would like to see some more animalistic races. Just add a little flavor. I don't know what you would do uh, for a rhino. I don't know enough about rhinos. I feel like I should research rhinos a little more to figure out what they could add mechanically with rhinos, but... Well, of course, they have their, you know, they can charge, and they have their big horn up front. Yeah, but the, uh, then there's, like, minotaurs, and do we just, do we need another minotaur that we don't like? I mean... No. Maybe there's it, something about rhinos that I don't know that's really cool or interesting, so... I, I think if you did some bio, like, research the actual rhinos and see what they had going for them, maybe we could come up with something, some cool mechanic for them. Um, Next is uh, Tree Folk. They're going to be, like, the good version of the Treants. Um, that already exist in D&D. Much like the Dryads, they're going to have that different perspective on the world. They're going to grow up in forests mostly. and I mean, obviously, they're going to have bark skin on at all times. Um, <laughs> things like that. You're probably going to end up being like an alternate furbolg or something like that. You can have some fun with that. Then you have trolls. Trolls are like orcs, but bigger. I think, I think for trolls, what they should do is they should kind of make them Kind of like dwarves that are sometimes depicted. You know, they they like make stuff and they can harness magic and like the, this. This picture here has them with you know some kind of like investigative goggle on to see to check the anatomy of what he's doing. Like I mentioned, there was a troll in the, one of the stories that has like the best restaurant in Strixhaven. You know, they could be your another kind of crafter, but like different they than the dwarves. Crafters. Yeah, and that's what I feel they should be. I feel very strongly about this, and I don't know why. And I, I like that they just have these big, giant, you know, f- like, tusks that kind of go out. I mean, I know trolls in D&D are traditionally have that resistance, uh, have that weakness to fire and acid and, and stuff like that. And maybe they could keep that with them, but have the regenerative ability. I mean... A player character with regenerative ability would be interesting. The trolls in D&D have, you know, keen smell and regeneration, but they also have their, you know, the you have to have the ch- shut it off with fire and acid, right? That's Yeah. Yeah, that's what, what it is. That's an interesting mechanic. I mean, that alone makes them powerful. It works in a world full of wizards because you're not going to have a lot, you're not going to have barbarians or, or fighters even. I mean, you're looking at a D8 hit point tops or D6 to D8. So they're not going to be big damage sponge. You probably wouldn't want to make the player characters regenerate less than 10 hit points at the start of each of its turns. Maybe just one or five or something like that. Uh, it would be interesting to see that as a player character race. We have the turtle folk. We already have the turtle already exists. I imagine we'll that's, just use that. that would probably just use that and go from there. This particular picture I pulled up is pretty cool. Obviously, some kind of a, it must be a Quandrix sorcerer, and it's just cool. And then they have the vampires. We have the Dampier from um, Van, Van Richten. Richten's got yeah, the from, to Ravenloft. Yeah, they should go with the Dampier. You know, it should be something that can be out during the day still have that hunger, they should just use that. and That's fine. You know, a lot of the Magic the Gathering vampires, even from their, uh, um, the Blade and Shift documents, are basically like Dampiers more anyways. So they could either use the Blade Shifted vampires or use the Dampier, one or the other. You might end up with or both. both. I, I could see both being there. You know, maybe they'll, maybe they'll reprint that from the Blade Shift. Yeah, so like, that, that goes to say, there's just a lot of races that they could really bring in 
in yeah. to it like they did with Ravnica and, and Theros. So but also most importantly, people from all over the multiverse go to um strict havens. You can play any race you want to. Yeah, that's true too. I mean they basically I'd say the only race you should play is um Yanti because that'd be way overpowered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no it would be but magic I mean magic resistance the magic school. Exactly. So, like, you know, Planeswalkers can obviously come to Strixhaven and have kids, and they could be of any race. You, you don't necessarily want to have your characters be Planeswalkers unless that's what you're doing for your campaign. And that, that opens up a whole new can of worms, and, well, that could be fun. Don't get me wrong. That's that's something different, you know? Yeah, I, I like eating worms. Ah, <laughs> uh, Tyler. Worm lover. <laughs> no, I like... Squirrels more, but I don't like to eat squirrels. True enough. But, yeah, and they have a special name for squirrels called Scurrids here for some reason. I don't know why they had to be different. They sh- squirrels are amazing. They should have squirrel folk. This is a really strict statement. I just, they should have squirrel folk. They should. All right, so. Okay. I think that's going to wrap it up for today as our discussion of Strict yeah. Haven. We will be talking more about Strict Haven, so um, stay tuned. Yep. See you next time. Or or we don't, and we'll murder you. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, so have a good day. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> Here's where we talk about garbage. You cut, you cut up, buddy. Are you all right? I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. I thought you were dead. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not dead. I'm alive. I'm alive, baby. All right. Is that a little better? I mean, my face is a little yeah. glowy, but um, it's better than gold out. Yeah, I, I was looking like I'm the ghost version of a fat man. Um. The ghost of a diet pass. <laughs> <laughs> also, fix your camera. You're going gray all the time. Yeah. Not use your hair. <laughs> <laughs> hey. So speaking of gray, um, we're actually more of white. Um, there's the core. Lots of white in this room. <laughs> That's true. Um, lots of white. Okay. Speaking around the log. What's oh. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking around the log. 